Hello, Hidden Gems. We are here. Wait, I need a microphone. Does that work? Is that better? That's, yes, that's better. <laughs> Hello, Hidden Gems. We are here for another Hidden Hour, the last one of the year of 2023. Not the last one, the last one of 2023. Thanks to all of your support and your Patreon memberships and uh, your generosity uh, on YouTube and elsewhere. We will be continuing Hidden True Crime into 2024. So thank you. We uh, are are so happy to be here tonight with all of you. We actually have so uh, much going on. Family coming into town, friends coming into town. We are going to celebrate John's mother tomorrow morning. And But we just couldn't uh, not be here tonight with all of you. So for those wondering why we're not going live on Saturday, forgive me for the typo in the thumbnail. Uh, it is tonight. Let your friends know that we're confused. But the reason we're not going live tomorrow is because we do have family in town. We're going to, again, honor John's mother and celebrate the life she lived. And thus, here we are on Friday night. But we couldn't we couldn't let this go because Jody Hildebrandt, who we have been covering and following from the very beginning, the therapist to eight passengers, YouTuber mom, Ruby Frankie, both were charged with aggravated child abuse, six counts. But Jody Hildebrand, the therapist, is now pleaded guilty to six counts of, ag or excuse me, four counts of the six, four counts of aggravated child abuse. I was there in court. It was a small courtroom in St. George, Utah, Southern Utah, Washington County. And I was there with other local journalists, as well as long crime, watched it go down. Uh, you know, it was a waiver hearing, so it was a possibility. But Ruby Frankie, a big part of Ruby Frankie's plea deal that uh, she took a week prior to all of this, she's against her therapist and business partner, Jody Hildebrandt, when it came to the abuse of these victims. But uh, Ruby Frankie will now no longer need to testify against her partner in crime. So, uh, a lot is going through my mind. Like I said, I was there watching it all go down, live tweeting. I, I got home and I thought, John, we have got to talk about this. We have, we just, we need to sort of unpack this together as hidden gems and as people who care about these victims. And we're going to do that tonight. We're going to talk even more hidden motives, Jody Hildebrandt as well. We have some things to share tonight, some videos we're going to go over. John, where would you like to start? Well, let me start by saying that, that we really haven't had a chance to sit down and unpack it since you got home. So I guess this is going to be our first chance to really um, unpack, the, unravel the the whole situation together. So Figuratively and literally, I might say. Yeah, I, right. I haven't had time to unpack since my yeah. road trip. <laughs> right. I pulled this sweater, okay. some might recognize. Some might recognize my sweater. I pulled this sweater out of my suitcase just now and put it on. Right. <laughs> Your suitcase is still waiting to be unpacked. Unpacked. But first, priorities. Let's first unpack the plea deal. Yeah. So I, there, I think there's just, let's talk in broad terms. I think there's a lot of similarities here. I think they accepted similar counts. The Jody Hildebrandt plea deal reads very similarly to the Ruby Frankie one. Um, Jody in court was more succinct. She was more terse. She basically just gave yes and no answers, whereas Ruby extrapolate. She 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 provided more. She provided some sentences, so she gave more than single word answers. So. She was more eloquent. I don't know if that's the right term, but she was certainly um, more verbose than than Jody was. So there wasn't a lot to see in terms of looking at at Jody's nonverbals. I mean, pretty much straightforward answers. One interesting thing that the lawyer said is that this is not an Alfred plea. I thought that was interesting. Uh, an Alfred plea means essentially that you're not admitting to guilt. Although, uh, so an Alfred plea means that you're not accepting guilt. Although if you went to trial, the preponderance of the evidence would probably show that you're guilty. So an Alfred plea is interesting because um, 
It's essentially a guilty plea without admitting guilt. And that was mentioned by uh, the attorney um, during the, the, that four minute plea hearing that it's not an Alfred plea. And I think that was interesting because there were probably some negotiations around an Alfred plea that my guess is that, that Jody probably considered or maybe even pushed for an Alfred plea because she didn't want to admit guilt. Uh, obviously that changed or her attorney was able to somehow persuade her not to take an Alfred plea because my guess is the state probably wasn't going to go there. But uh, just the fact that that was mentioned was interesting because it, it would suggest that during negotiations that that was on the table. So by her attorney saying, nope, this is not an Alfred plea, he was clarifying, I think, something that was a part of the negotiations here. Also, there's going to be a PSI. That's a pre-sentence investigation report. That's usually done by probation or parole, depending. Um, they usually, so the state will do a pre-sentence investigation and make recommendations about sentencing. That may or may not include a forensic evaluation. So a lot of times I will get pulled into these types of pre-sentence investigation reports to do some type of testing or evaluation or risk assessment. I'm not sure if that will be the case here. The reason I'm not sure is because she did stipulate to prison time. So I talked about this briefly in our last show, but usually when there's a stipulation to prison time, you know, psychological evaluations are going to be less necessary. So one of the reasons that a forensic evaluator like myself might be brought in is to, to add some objectivity that the idea is that if the state is doing the PSI, then perhaps it's going to be more biased or it's going to be the recommendations are going to be stronger for more prison time. So sometimes a forensic evaluator will be brought in to provide a little more balance and objectivity in theory. And that somebody like myself might make recommendations about risk or sentencing um, that in theory can be a little more objective than the state. So so we'll see. We'll see if there's an evaluation that, that goes into effect here. Should we quickly watch this plea deal together? I feel like I kind of want to watch it and ask you a couple of questions about it. Okay. Um, I mean, it's, it's, if you it's short. It's about four yeah. minutes total. So let's uh, watch this really quickly together. Terry is here with Ms. Hill 763. Mr. Clark and Mr. Shum are here representing the state of Utah, and Mr. Terry is here with Ms. Hildebrand. We are scheduled for a waiver of preliminary hearing. Mr. Terry, it appears you uh, have just handed the court a signed plea agreement. That is correct, Your Honor. Uh, with respect to the waiver, Ms. Hildebrandt, we have had discussions. She fully understands the purpose of a preliminary hearing, what the burden of proof would be, um, and that she has the right to a preliminary hearing, but in conjunction with the entry of her plea today, we waive the preliminary hearing. And in fact, there is a provision in the written plea agreement that uh, operates as a waiver of That's a correct. preliminary hearing. All right. Ms. Hildebrandt, I've been handed a written document, a plea agreement with your signature on it. Did you sign that document? Yes. And you did that to represent to the court that you have read the document carefully, that you understand what you've read, that you agree to all of the terms that are set forth in that written document? Yes, sir. You've had sufficient time to ask Mr. Terry any questions that you have about the agreement or its potential effect? Yes. Is anyone pressuring you to enter into this agreement or is anyone promising you anything that I haven't been told about or that is not in the written document? No. 
Are you under the influence of alcohol or drugs today? No. Is there anything today that could interfere in any way with your ability to understand the, the agreement its, or its potential consequences? No. No physical condition, mental health or emotional condition, nothing that could interfere with your present ability to evaluate the agreement and decide if it's what you're prepared to do today? No. You don't need more time, you're ready to go? Yes. Any further record, counsel? Your Honor, the agreement contains a factual basis. Um, there are a few details in the factual basis that we are not in full agreement with. However, this is a guilty plea. It is not an Alfred plea. The factual basis set forth, sets forth facts that uh, we agree with, uh, that Ms. Hildebrand agrees with, that are sufficient for the court to accept her plea with respect to the four counts uh, to which she is pleading guilty. And so we ask the court to accept her plea agreement. And apart from what is in the written factual base in the plea agreement, you have, I'm assuming, re reviewed voluminous discovery. You, yeah. you don't dispute whether there is an actual or an ad adequate factual basis. We do not. All right, then. Anything else before the court receives Ms. Hildebrandt's please? No, Your Honor. Nothing for the state, Your Honor. Then, Ms. Hildebrandt, how do you plead to count one, aggravated child abuse, a second-degree felony? Guilty. And to count three, aggravated child abuse, a second-degree felony? Guilty. To count five, aggravated child abuse, a second-degree felony? Guilty. And to count six, also aggravated child abuse, a second-degree felony? Guilty. The court finds that there is a sufficient factual basis. The court, in addition, finds that Ms. Hildebrandt's pleas are made knowingly and voluntarily. The court, therefore, accepts and enters those pleas, dismisses the remaining two counts. We are anticipating a PSI, although part of the plea agreement appears to be that Ms. Hildebrandt will not contest a prison sentence. Correct. Is that right? That is correct. But we, we are... We are asking for a PSI. All right. Then the court orders the preparation of a pre-sentence investigation report and sets sentencing at 10.30 a.m. on February 20th. Anything else for today, counsel? Nothing from us, Your Honor. Nothing from us, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. We'll be in recess. Thank you, Your Honor. All right. Thank you for watching that. Uh, one more time with us all. I think we all need to watch that together. Paula Marie says that she believes what Jody is feeling is distortion. But but what do you think? <laughs> Your mic is off. Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Um, I guess it depends on what you mean by distortion, but yes, this is uh, actually the irony is that this is probably one of the few moments where she hasn't experienced distortion. She's had to come face to face with firm reality. So, but true distortion is, is one of her themes. So in looking at that, you know, it, it's, it's hard to really assess it because I can't see her directly. There's, you know, the cameras on the side, so it makes it a little tricky, but it does seem like with Jody, it does seem like there's always kind of this underlying anger, this underlying tension. And I, I think you see some of that, that, uh, you know, clearly this is someone who doesn't want to be in this position. I mean, this is someone who perceived themselves to be a prophet of sorts. So to sit in front of a judge and admit guilt to four counts of child abuse is, has got to be humbling to some degree. But again, I don't know, maybe if she's in distortion, then maybe not, but, but there does seem to be a little bit of tension, anger, resistance, whatever, you know, I guess there's different terms we could use to describe it, but, uh, and also some anxiety. She seems, she clearly seems a little anxious and that, that could be part of the, the tension or kind of the anger, but it, it may be, it could also be maybe a slight sign of 
some remorse or contrition or guilt. I, I don't know. It could go either way on, you know, it could go either way there. Ben from Law and Crime. Hello. Um, he said that uh, my segment aired yesterday on Law and Crime. I'll have to check that out. And Lisa Fowler, thank you so much. Uh, but back to what you were saying, John. Yes, anxiety. I actually thought that was really validating how you expressed that she was feeling. That's what I felt, too. Um, right. She was certainly she was certainly making an expression. <laughs> That's for sure. Is what I thought. She wasn't. She wasn't like Chad Daybell when we watch him in court. He's just like. Like, <laughs> yeah the, you know, right. she definitely she definitely had emotions on her face whatever they were um yeah, yeah. i wish we could have had the, the the camera in front of her to see her facial expressions more prominently but yeah I, you know i definitely pick up some anxiety and like i said that could be maybe there's a little bit of remorse that's creeping in but I, you know i i think predominantly i would i would probably go with something more like anger that you know she's this is not obviously what she wants. I mean, she's giving up so much. She's worked so hard to be this prophet. So prophet Tess, whatever she is. So, uh, I, you know, she's giving, obviously this is, she's giving up a huge amount of power, money. I mean, I could go on and on. Right. So, so they're, they're, you know, she's, she's clearly not happy about this situation. No. There were no smiles. You yeah, know, CC no. mentioned CC mentioned that Chad Dable hardly blinks, and it's true. She was blinking overtime. I mean, maybe she just had contact issues. I don't know, but Jody couldn't stop blinking. I I noticed that was like she was over blinking. Carla's making the observation that she looks terrified. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I you know it's uh, I. I I think well maybe I don't know that's a good question there could be some fear you know they're oftentimes behind kind of some anger and tension there's some fear uh you know that's an interesting question because I actually see Jody as someone who might do well in prison in the sense that you know she with her with her arrogance and her belief system you know I could see her trying to kind of dominate in prison and she might be able to do that right prison may not be for her she's probably going to bring her if she does have traits of psychopathy she's probably going to bring those into prison with her into the prison culture and and i wouldn't be surprised if she begins another cult in prison <laughs> or or some version of what she's doing i don't know it wouldn't be about therapy obviously maybe it would be but I don't know. It'll it'll be really fascinating to see what happens when she's in she's prison. She's gonna start. She's gonna start running group therapy in prison. Teaching her about <laughs> distortion. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Makes you worried. Hopefully not. Sorry. Bad joke. Let's hope she doesn't. Um. <laughs> we've if all been. Does, during if this she week. does, by the way, she won't be doing it with a license. True. <laughs> uh, you know, so, so for, I just want to share my opinion about it too. You know, when I was there, I went out, I reported, I was in reporter mode and I wasn't sharing a lot of my feelings. I was just sharing what had happened. I interviewed two wonderful women Hello, if you're watching Allie and Aubrey, they, they grew up watching eight passengers and came, drove four hours to watch this plea deal. I just want to tell you my feelings about it. So this is non-reporter Lauren. Um, while I'm grateful that the victims will not have to testify, if they don't want to, I am grateful, you know, for that, if if that would put them through more trauma. I think that I am upset that she took a plea deal because they mentioned in court, you heard it. There was this volum vol voluminous discovery of information. We're just seeing a snippet. And I, from what we've read in the plea deal, there's, there was one piece by the way, in Jody's plea deal that uh, was not in Ruby's. It's just terrible. I'll let you share it, John, but yeah, uh, my feelings inside of me are um, anger because I feel like nobody's going to ever know everything she did 
And what she did is so cruel and unspeakable. I don't know. There's a part of me that just does wish for her mask to completely fall off. But at the same time, I have to acknowledge that that's not super healthy either. I don't want revenge and I need to not, I don't know. I'm just telling you, and maybe I, maybe I'm wrong to feel this way, but I guess, I guess I, I just want to share that personal thing with our gems, what, what I am feeling about. I don't always share, but I'm think, well, I'm grateful the victims will not have to testify if they don't want to. I'm upset that, you know, we won't know the full scope of everything Jody Hildebrandt did because of this plea deal. Yeah. It, it, and when you talk about that, it actually reminds me a little bit of the post herring press conference that you attended. Do you want to? So, so her lawyer came out and did a little PR in front of the media, right? Do you want to talk about that for a minute? Yeah. Um, you know, again, we played, I played it live for everyone. The moment court was out, there was a press conference with both the defense attorney and prosecuting attorney. And so I recorded a full, of course, the, uh, news agencies, many people have probably seen it. They had better cameras than I did. I was on my cell phone real time, but you can hear me asking questions and, uh, so if you heard a voice that sounded like mine, it was because it was mine. <laughs> and I think the most important question I wanted to ask was asked to the prosecuting attorney, which is um, aggravated abuse in Utah is only a second, second degree felony. And should that be changed? And I was satisfied with the response I got in that he did say, yes, uh, we are talking with the legislature about that. Um, I think, you know what, and I'm glad you brought that up because I think that's why I'm upset. I want those laws changed. Thank you for clarifying it for me. Why I'm upset that she, that she made this plea, that she took a guilty plea, is because I feel like if the world heard what Jody Hildebrandt did, that perhaps those laws would absolutely change. And there's a part of me that is worried that if we don't hear and that this gets covered and we move to the next thing and the next case, the next crime, it goes underground and laws don't change and nothing gets better and it happens again. So maybe you help me just clarify what I'm most worried about with this plea deal. Well, and also let's talk about sentencing that the, if the minimum sentence she could get because these are second degree felonies would be four years. So she could get four years. And if she's a decent inmate, which she probably would be, she'll be controlling, I'm sure. But if she's, she's a, a good inmate and responsible and doesn't get into trouble, we the, in prison, they call that good time. She accumulates good time. Essentially, in a state prison system, it's different in the federal system because good time doesn't go as far. But in the state prison system, most state prison systems, a inmate who accumulates good time will, will cut their sentence in half. So essentially, she, if she gets the minimum of four years and she gets a decent amount of good time, she's looking at two years. Potentially even less than that, depending on the situation. So think about that for a minute, right? That's that's part of the issue here too. So and and I'll, we'll be talking about. I talked about about what Ruby did, what 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 was contained in her her plea deal, and I'll, I'll be talking about what Jody did in a minute too. But the you know the the question obviously in in this particular case where the abuse is so severe. I noticed a question earlier about how does this stack up to other cases of child abuse I've seen. Uh, it's definitely on the, on the more extreme end. There are some cases I've seen which are just unthinkable, by the way. I, I, if I talk about them, you know, YouTube will, <laughs> YouTube will flag us in a heartbeat. So I want to be careful. But I, I, there, 
the worst case of child abuse I've ever seen where a child survived was a situation where there was a lot of torture and the child had very severe brain trauma. And that's, that's as far as I'll go. But so fortunately in this case, these victims will recover fully. And some of the more severe cases I've seen, the victims will never recover fully because of their brain trauma. So, uh, so I mean, <laughs> and it's just in the cases that I've seen that are extremely severe on the, on the, you know, extreme end, it, it's just, it's, un, it's unbelievable. It's unthinkable. It's, unimaginable but this this case is certainly more towards the extreme end the one thing the one difference the one different line in the in jody hildebrandt's plea deal compared to ruby's was one additional act yeah that, yeah go ahead actually actually they're they're there's there's a couple that I want to compare if if that's okay. Let me please please do that. In, yeah, let me. So let let's talk quickly about the commonalities between the two plea deals. The so some of the commonalities were physical torture. I won't get into specifics. You guys can read the the plea agreements if you want to look at them. We'll, are they on? We, did we put them on Patreon yet? We will put it on okay. Patreon. I sent it to you. It's on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash hidden true crime. We have been behind with family coming into town. So I will get those on Patreon tonight. In fact, I'll do that right now while you talk. So the, some of the commonalities uh, in Jody's plea agreement, you have physical torture. That was also true of Ruby. You have the hog tying component. That was in Ruby's handcuffing. That was in Ruby's. There's emotional abuse with Jody. There's social isolation. There's starvation. There's indoctrination. All of those were true of Ruby. I'm going to read a line from Ruby's that was not in Jody's. And so this is on page four of Ruby's plea deal. It says, quote, specific instances of abuse committed by the defendant include number one, Kicking RF, RF is the, one of the victims, kicking RF while wearing boots, two, holding his head underwater, and three, cutting off oxygen by placing her hands over his mouth and nose. So Ruby essentially engaged in, we called it waterboarding, but some type of waterboarding and or drowning, strangulation, and kicking someone with kicking someone with one of the victims with boots. That was not in Jody's plea agreement. So those were those were behaviors specific to Ruby. There is, however, there is a line, a sentence in. Jody's plea agreement, which pertains only to her, and it does not overlap with Ruby. And I'm going to read that now. This is on page four of Jody's plea deal. It is, quote, additionally, the defendant, meaning Jody, additionally, the defendant either physically forced or coerced EF, one of the victims, to jump into a cactus multiple times. So that was specific to Jody, that Jody either physically pushed one of the victims or coerced them through threats to jump into a cactus, not once, multiple times. And when I read that, I, I mean, I don't, I can't say I've ever seen that in a child abuse case, by the way, like throwing someone onto a cactus. It's, it's beyond, it's so cruel. I, I, you know, I, I, I guess it depends on the type of cactus, but I mean, number at a minimum, you're going to, you're going to experience a lot of pain. I think potentially depending on how you land on the cactus could be fatal. Right. We and lived so, in this area. I was a reporter in this town. You get one of those long cactus needles in you. You're in pain for a very, very long time. 
Right. It, it's horrible. So, I mean, so you have to picture Jody picking a one of the victims up and throwing that victim onto a cactus. I mean, think about that. It, what if she lands on her face or she punctures her heart? I, I don't know. Like, I, when I read that, it, it was just beyond belief. But it, it certainly, for me, it raised some questions about whether that would be attempted murder potentially, right? Like, I, I mean, I guess it depends on the specifics of how she was doing it, but... I can't get over that the probable cause of life-threatening injuries, you know, the, the next, the charge's next step would be attempted. But I guess that's harder to argue in court. Right. So I, I think of all the elements of, of Jody's plea agreement that that was probably the most shocking and that was probably the one and it, it's buried at the end by the way you can you can miss it if you read through this quickly you'll miss that particular sentence but uh as emily just pointed out that's sadistic yeah uh jody jody is very sadistic there's no question mm -hmm. about it interesting she, i wanted to know if you were going to say that that's what i felt okay yeah well in one of our earlier episodes episodes on jody we actually talked about her rage and kind of her sadistic quality, her lack of empathy. Uh, I raised some questions and, and I'm, I'm talking specifically for those who have seen the Mormon stories interview with Jesse, who is a niece of Jody's that I think you really see that Jesse speculates that her aunt, and this is not my term. This is Jesse's term. Jesse speculates that she's a psychopath. So whether whether Jesse understands that term in the same way I do, I don't know. But 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 she also talked about the sadism and the rage and the lack of empathy. And so I, I I'm getting a lot of that from that interview. But if you look at if you just look at what she did, um, and you listen to the Jesse interview, and you kind of look more broadly at how per how she perceives the world, it's it's not a stretch to see those qualities. I have another video uh, that Jody did last year for Connections. We've covered Jody extensively, but I found this video and a Connections video that it was done in December of last year. Can we 20. get into that now? Is now a good time or was there anything else you wanted to cover? December of was it wasn't it 20 was it 2021 or 22 I think it was 2022 Okay Sure yeah let's take a look at it So this video might win an award for the video that did not age well <laughs> this year and it's terrible but I the reason why we're going to play it in that I, that I want John to go over. I think this is what I really want to do tonight is I want, I think I'm getting the same question over and over again. We just heard about the cactus. Yeah. We just can't understand how, or people, me included, I'm with all of you asking Dr. John this question. So when I say we can't get over, I'm talking about our hidden gems and I'm one of them right now asking you, how could a therapist, someone that claims she's religious, some, like how could a therapist and someone that claims to help people think this is okay and do this or does she, or how could they, how could anyone do this to a child, let alone a person in this position? So I want to talk about this video and it's a nine minute video by Jody Hildebrandt discussing things she is doing to Ruby Frankie's children a Bef year ago. Before you do that, I think it would be important to reiterate a little bit about Jody's background. So we don't Please. know a huge, we don't know a huge amount, but we, we, Jody has talked publicly about a little bit about her upbringing and Jesse has talked about her upbringing. And so we have some information about her, her childhood. Um, let me just reiterate some of those issues before you play this, because it'll it might provide some context. But Jody's father was a colonel in the Air Force. 
so very much a disciplinarian. Her mother, she described as, quote, not maternal at all. So she perceived her mother to be not particularly feminine, I guess, if that's the right term. She saw her mother as being fairly stern, like her father in many ways. She said of her parents, she said, quote, they're emotionally shut down and not available. So one of the main themes in her life is that she saw her family as essentially an emotionless family, that one of the main messages from her family was you don't show emotion. She thought the home was somewhat chaotic. She believed the home had a lot of anger and she believed there was a tendency to stuff emotion. One of the quotes that Jody had during one of her videos that where she was talking about her past, she said, quote, I tried to control everything because I had no outlet to emote my emotions. So she's, she herself is giving us a little glimpse of these issues she has around control or, you know, to take it a step further, maybe even coercive control. I, I mean, I don't know quite how severe the control was. It was obviously severe, but so she's, she's telling us quite a bit about her past just through these, some of these points. So I think another issue is that she said she was a loner growing up, that she didn't have a lot of friends. She was isolated in school, right? So these are probably all elements that are going to come into play in the later abuse. And we'll talk about why, but so I think that maybe that provides a little context for the, for the video you're going to show. That does provide context. Thank you for that. Oh, and I'm sorry that <laughs> another, an, another really important component of her childhood was that she, she claims that, and uh, you know, I'm going to believe her because she claims she's a victim. She was a victim of molestation between the ages of two and five, and then later between the ages of seven and nine. So apparently two different people, two different assaults. She was young and that was a big part of her. So she experienced childhood trauma as well. So that was, that was a big part of her childhood in addition to the other elements. CC, thank you for reminding everyone about where to <coughs> find Patreon. Um, we appreciate your support so much over there. And then also that people can buy their hidden gem shirts. Um, I want to bring up shy gal eights comment right now. She states, I am a survivor. I've never, ever wanted to hurt another. And as always, we never want to imply that. I just thought it was right. important. There's, yeah, I, right. Let me point out there's, there's that childhood trauma and adversity does not translate into harming other people. It does not translate into violence or crimes. It can, under a given set of circumstances, it can, with a particular person experiencing something, someone who's maybe less resilient or somebody who lacks any emotional intelligence. I mean, there's, there's going to be a number of factors that will have to come together to create a criminal. But most victims and most people who experience adversity in childhood do not go on to become violent and they don't go on to commit crimes. So I, I didn't want to imply that. There's not a causal relationship between childhood trauma and later violence at all. Um, there does seem to be, however, a disproportionate number of criminals who have experienced childhood adversity, but they're also they also have another a, a, a number of other key components that come together to create later violence. So, and one of those would be a lack of resiliency. Oftentimes, intelligence may play a role. There's a lot of things. There's always a lot of elements. But, but yeah, there's not. So I, I, I didn't mean to imply that. I'm sorry if, if, if that was my um, implicit message there. That's, that's not what I meant. Thank you. And I am seeing some great comments <coughs> and questions popping up, and we will certainly be asking them. All right. I'm going to start playing this, John, 
and you tell me when you want me to pause it and start and pause it and start. Um, How about, why don't you, um, I've only listened to this quickly. Why don't you pause it and ask some questions or pause it based on people's responses? I think that would be a little easier. Okay. All right. Here we go. I'm giving you complete control. Okay. Trigger warning. You're about to watch Jody Hildebrandt <laughs> for any of those <laughs> that need to leave the room. Yeah. I may have to take a few deep breaths. Yes. Prepare yourself. Saddened by um, some of the comments that have been made on um, our social media platform in a reactionary measure to Uh, the couples conference that we had last weekend or couples workshop that we had talking about truth and distortion. And for those of you who decided to be aggressive and mean and use foul language and be attacking, um, all of those people would be choosing to live in distortion, which means they're not willing to be empathic. They're not willing to stop and think about their responsibility. They're just reacting to something that they disagree with without being thoughtful about what exactly was being shared. Okay. Already, already I have questions. First okay. off, she's so smug. She's right. so self-righteous. Uh, yeah. She's so upset. As she, she is saying that anyone that disagrees with her is in distortion and refers to them as not being empathic because they're disagreeing with her. I mean, here we have someone that clearly doesn't have empathy or she's definitely right. missing an empathy chip. And yet she's yeah. saying that <laughs> people that disagree with her and use foul language. I want to talk about that too. Foul language really upsets Jody Hildebrand. So disagreeing with her and using foul language mean that you're in distortion and that you're not empathic and not being thoughtful. And also what the hell does distortion mean? I purposely used hell because she doesn't like foul language. It makes me want to (laughs) just, there's a worried. You're worried that she's going to hear this in in prison. (laughs) I'm not worried. I'm, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to start swearing more because I'm, just want to disappoint Jody Hildebrandt tonight. Um, but so first off, you know, well, so yeah, let, let's look at, so yeah, that that's, that's a good place to start because let's look at the underlying assumption here. The, the question, when somebody is talking like this, the question is not only what distortion means, but who mediates that? In other words, if there's distortion in truth, that means somebody has to be the mediator of truth. Somebody has to know what the truth is, and they have to be able to, to explain that or to see that so that the rest of us, you know, the rest of us in distortion understand, right? And so the, what she's saying essentially is there's only two options with her, by the way. Either she's mediating the truth directly or she's she's exposed she's she's giving us the truth directly means meaning that she's a prophet or she's godlike or which could also be the case with Jody she's has direct access to god who gives her the truth so she mediates the truth between god and the rest of us um so she's the intermediary between god and right so that i mean so a big question here is if, if you're if you're calling everyone out for distortion then you have to there has to be some basis for that and the basis is that you you have the truth or she has the truth otherwise there's no way to know what distortion is right so i, I think that's at, you know underneath all of this is the fact that she thinks she has the truth and or she thinks she communicates directly with god who has the truth and that that she can then translate what god says into distortion so i mean right away you have kind of this massive issue with i don't know like a messiah complex or right she she thinks she's got the truth her whole system is based on that idea right if she has the truth then if you disagree with her then shame on you right shame on you you're you know you're a sinner you're not you're not in touch with god you're not taking her seriously 
you know, how could you not take her seriously? She knows what the truth is. Right. And so that those are all the qualities you would see in a cult leader, by the way. Right. And people are, people are mentioning the irony too. Like she is okay with what she did to these victims yet foul language offends her. I mean, right. I just, yeah. So one thing I want to say is I did have on the way home. Y'all I'm so sorry about this cough. I have, as you know, John's been coughing for about a month and I think that I'm now finally getting, I apologize, but she, you know, so I, I was speaking to somebody who says that she became one of, Jody's disciples. Um, I won't give any identifying information. This person wants to remain anonymous, but I actually spoke to this person for a couple of hours about their journey into believing Jody Hildebrandt and falling for the cult of Jody Hildebrandt. I am using this person's language. And she told me that that distortion, Jody would often call sin distortion which is interesting to me because when we listened to her at the eternal core conference and we went through her talk and her philosophy there, uh, she referred to distortion meaning shame, but now we're, so does that mean that's that she considers shame sinful or disagreeing with her sinful or foul language? But I thought that was really insightful to hear that the sin is distortion too. You know, and again, very Puritan, all of this. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think that I could see her equating shame with sin in the sense that she would see shame as weakness. Jody is, is not someone who values weakness. Although she says that she's empathic, she's not weak. She's actually quite strong. She's you know, she's, she has a very powerful message that she wants to convey. And she's the one with that message. She's, you know, she's quite adamant about that. She's not, she's not valuing any type of vulnerability or weakness. Okay. Okay. Well, we will move on now. Um, I like what legal cat lady said, just 10 seconds of her. And I feel attacked and gaslighted or gaslit. What do you say? Lighted lit. Uh, I couldn't agree more. That's why I stopped. I'm like, we haven't even gotten to the meat of this. I'm already just like, (laughs) I know. Okay. Here we go. We have about 3,500 people in chat. So please make sure you hit like and uh, share a video. Let's keep going. So those of you who sincerely have questions, I want to respond to those. So one of the questions is, um, it, was this manipulative? Uh, is this going to cause childhood trauma? And then the last question was, young children show up selfishly. Uh, why do something according to these particular comments that looks drastic? Um, I want to respond to those. So I have dedicated my life to truth. And truth has been hated since the beginning of time. Since Adam and Eve, truth has been hated. So it doesn't surprise me that distortion is attacking truth. And those of you who have been mean and aggressive and hateful in your comments, you are the reason why there's so much distortion in the world because you keep. Okay. So yeah, she just said it. You already said this, but I'm going to repeat what Dr. John has already nailed. She has dedicated her life to truth. And so it's, but it's no question that there's so much distortion in the world because it's people distortion is people attacking her because she is truth. So Jody is truth as you already pointed out. And when you attack Jody, you're distorted. Um, anything else I, I, should also, I should also point out, she says that the truth has been, what is she? How did, did truth has, has been people have fought against the truth since Adam and Eve. Right. What she doesn't say also, by the way, is that people who think they have the troop have have killed and harmed and maimed a lot of people too. So she kind of leaves that part out. Right. There's a lot of people who have been, there's a lot of people who over, over the years who have worn the cloak of truth and they've harmed a lot of people. So, 
but so I'm so glad to hear that she's the truth. That's that's quite comforting to know. <laughs> hey, by the way, we're talking about like red flags, warnings for cults. When okay. someone says they're the truth. Yeah. That might be a problem. Yeah, you might want to <laughs> you might want to think twice if someone tells you that. If you're if you're going on a date with someone and they tell you that they're the truth or they have the truth, yeah, you might want to I want to get the check quickly. Yeah. All right. Lee Lee here. Thank you so much. Here we go. Perpetuating it. Those of you who are sincere and really would like to know, like, why are these parents, Kevin and Ruby, doing what they're doing? I'd like to respond to that. Kevin and Ruby have six children and they have learned how to live in truth. And so I can't explain all of the details in three minutes. But let me just describe to you some of the principles that they're using to govern their decisions. Several of their children, two of their children in particular, have been making choices that have been very, very selfish. And when someone starts becoming selfish, they don't feel empathy for people any longer. It's really clear by some of the comments that have been made that these help me wrap my brain around this. So we are now talking about the victims. We're talking about the victims here. Mm -hmm. She states that these victims have been doing things that are selfish. And when you are selfish, you no longer have empathy and she is shaming them. We'll keep listening. Maybe I stopped it yeah. too soon. Keep going. Should keep going. Okay. Okay. I'll, I'll go back a little bit because John's right. Okay. And when someone starts becoming selfish, they don't feel empathy for people any longer. It's really clear by some of the comments that have been made that these children or these young adults don't feel empathy for people. And so they don't even know me and they've attacked me personally. They've sent messages of I'm going to you know, destroy you. I'm going to attack your, your Google reviews. I'm going to hurt you if you do not do what I tell you to do. That is all distorted behavior. And it's coming from a place of incredible selfishness, which at the base of that is distortion. So Ruby and Kevin have seen these behaviors in their two children, and they are desperately concerned about their eternal and um, their choices that they're going to make throughout their life. And so they are running interference with them and inviting them to pause and be thoughtful about what it is that they're choosing. It makes no rational sense. It does not support truth to have someone aggress and attack and be selfish and hateful and then hand them some kind of an offering called a gift, a tangible gift and say, hey, hey, let me reinforce your aggression. What Kevin and Ruby are doing, and if you'll watch the whole video, you'll hear them say this. They are offering them gifts that are not of a tangible nature. They are offering them the gift of learning to be responsible for themselves. They're offering them the gift of repentance, of being willing to turn from their ways and go back to God. They are offering them the gift of empathy. They spend many, many hours talking to their children and helping them understand why it is that, that these boundaries are being set. And those of us who have lived on the planet longer than 30 years understand that Christmas is not something that you're, you know, Christmas, the way Christmas is being played out now, which is all commercialism, pretty much. You're not entitled to a tangible gift. You're not entitled. I just talked to a lovely man. She doesn't breathe between thoughts. That's another thing that annoys me. I wait for like a good place to end, but she doesn't give space between her sentences. I think that's also so she can control what she's saying and have the last word. She doesn't allow people to talk, but beyond men who many people are mentioning that she really hates men in comments. Uh, she also hates anyone under 30. She says this <laughs> a couple times, anyone <laughs> under 30 who actually, you know, so we're also learning she really dislikes people under the age of 30. But John, I mean, people are screaming over here in chat. She's projecting. She's explaining herself. Like, it is so right. hard to wrap my mind. I mean, this is mental gymnastics that I'm hearing to justify cruelty 
and harsh punishment to children. And what we're specifically talking about is how these children, the victims last year, were not going to be given Christmas gifts. Yeah, I, I mean, it. right. I, I agree. I think a lot of this is projection. This is like classic projection in the sense that I think the underlying projection is that if she sees parents being kind to their kids or empathic to their kids, that probably really disturbs her in the sense that that is not what she experienced. I think so. So I think the projection is that she was wounded as a child. So she believes children that are selfish or show any signs of selfishness, they should be wounded too, or they should be put in their place. Um, I think this is what happened to her that when she showed any signs of being shellfish or wanting something right. Or when, which is typical, every child is selfish. I mean, that's just part of growing up is, is, I was a I was a seven year old mother Teresa. No, just kidding. <laughs> Part Our of problem. growing up is growing up is going from complete dependency to independence, and and that. So, in other words, every child is selfish. It's going from being selfish to being less selfish, right? Like, I mean, it's just it's part of the developmental progression, and so I don't. I think so again, yes, this comes back to her and her childhood and her projection that what she's unable to tolerate here, I think, is parents that are kind to their kids because she didn't have that kindness growing up and it, it, it disturbs her. So, yeah, she's projecting this kind of hatred or dislike or rage, rage towards these kids that <clears throat> she feels shouldn't be treated so kindly. Yeah, and, and I just want to point something out, too, when it comes to teaching empathy. Many people ask Dr. John a lot, how do you teach a child empathy? Because that's what she's talking about here. You know, if they're selfish, uh, you got to be mean to them, you know, in order for them to learn empathy, and, you know. <laughs> right, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what you don't do. What you don't do to teach empathy is you don't throw a child on a cactus. You also don't not give them Christmas gifts. If you want to teach empathy to a child, show them empathy. Well, you I did you not hear the part about she's giving the gift of responsibility and empathy and repentance. She's giving How is she giving the gift of empathy by cruelty? No, I know. I right. It's yeah. it's Yeah, I mean it, it No, it, I it, I'm with you. I know exactly. Yes, the gift of responsibility and empathy and never mind that i mean it, yeah it's i don't know though it's it's so <laughs> and she feels so justified i think that's the part of it. like she's so justified she's putting out a public video about this because it's truth thank you nj kathy empathy is learned when it's modeled by parents if you want to teach a child empathy you show them empathy and when, when, and maybe by friends, depending on age, right? Peers, parents, peers, friends, you, you also learn it by doing it. It's not, you know, you, you can be modeled, but then you, you do it, you practice it, you show empathy, you learn to show empathy yourself. And also through, through, we talked about this a little bit in, in some of our podcasts, the, the importance of emotion coaching in kids. That when you teach kids how to identify and express their fundamental emotions, they're going to be much better with empathy because they'll be able to, empathy is fundamentally an emotion. And so they'll be able to express, they'll be able to feel that connection to someone else. They'll be able to feel what that is and what it means and the importance of it. Yeah. I like that, Shelly. Shell and pets. Dr. John said it in a podcast episode. They start with stuffed animals. Um, you live it, Grandma. Um, someone was yeah. asking how she can be so unaware. She was a therapist. She got her master's in therapy, for goodness sake. I want to say, though, and I'll let you share since you're the, the one in therapy, um, but she does say in that eternal core 
conference because I wondered the same thing. How could she be trained in this yet do this? She explains that she really did hardly got any training. Don't you do a lot of shadowing other therapists at the beginning of your practice, but she sort of decided she knew what was best. Yeah. I'm trying to remember. I, um, I don't, yeah, that's a, the, so that's a complicated question. I mean, therapists, it depends on training models have changed so much, but when I was, when I was being trained, we had to videotape everything or audio tape and supervisors occasionally would be in the room. I mean, it's, it's yes. The, the model typically is finding a mentor or mentors to kind of teach you the ropes and to teach you about relationships to a large degree and how to connect to, to people in the room. And um, nowadays I don't think there's a lot of videotaping going on. I think things have changed quite a bit, but um, so I don't know where she would fall on that spectrum. I, I It sounds to me like, she wasn't supervised that closely, but I don't know. Supervision. Yeah. It didn't feel like she was supervised closely at all. I like what Coco B says. Uh, Brian Koberger was training his PH. His training was a PhD in criminology. So there is something there, right? I mean, was she trying, did she go into therapy to fix herself or other people? And did Brian Koberger go into criminology? Because yeah, it is interesting. Yeah. I, I, if I had to guess, I think she, well, some therapists become – some therapists go into the field because they want to fix other people and not themselves. So in that sense, I think it's, it's, it's somewhat like politicians. Politicians would rather change the world or create a policy to change the world rather than to look at their own flaws and their own shortcomings. right? For therapists, I think there's something similar. You have – Fortunately, I, th I think a fairly small subset of therapists, I think most therapists are good and and wholehearted and they mean well, but a small subset of therapists certainly get into therapy to fix their clients so they don't have to look at their own issues. They don't have to fix themselves. They don't really look at themselves, right? It's easier to project your issues onto other people than to really look inward and consider what's wrong with you. Thank you. I'm hearing people request. I slow the chat. I'm going to try to do that. Let's keep listening to Jody and I will slow the chat down. You said, you know, what happened to, um, you know, you know, back at my grandma's time, they got an orange. That was all they got for Christmas. And they were so grateful. We have a society now and much of it's being driven by people who are under 30 who feel very entitled to get what Those they want 30s. and for people to give them what they want. Just like I shared a minute ago, I've had hateful comments with people saying, if you don't take this video down, then I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to attack your Google reviews. I mean, this is horrible hatred coming towards someone they know nothing about, whether it's me or whether it's Kevin or Ruby, you know nothing about these two people. If you would be Okay, so right there, you know, she's, this whole discussion is about how people are upset that Kevin and Ruby and Jody are mean to kids. Right. And now, she, yet she's upset that these people that are upset want to write her bad Google reviews. She, she can't fathom that they would act in such a terrible way while, she, while they're... The mental gymnastics, man. The mental. Well, she gymnastics. she also can't fathom that maybe they have a valid point. She can't fathom that maybe they're actually seeing something real that's occurring that's troublesome. Right. Well, obviously they were. Obviously, obviously they had really valid reasons to to express concerns. Right. But so she's dismissing all of those concerns. And, and right, she's completely avoiding the issue, which is, are these practices of some concern? Are they, are these, th is this, is this the way that they should be parenting their children? 
Right. That's interesting. She doesn't even go there. She won't even consider right. the thought. It's about, it's she's just, getting on here to let everybody know they're wrong and she's truth. Because they're attacking her. They're not, she never addresses the core issue. She's just concerned about, it was sort of in the, the earlier show we did on Jody. we showed the little clip where precisely this, where she, she said she was more concerned about her reviews. She was asking people to go in there. She was basically saying to people, look, you know I'm really smart and I'm excellent, so go in there and give me great reviews. I don't know how you could possibly leave me a one-star review. Right. First of all, as if she can control that, as if she has some ability to control what people feel and express, right? Like you and I obviously know that for whatever reasons, people may or may not, li if people dislike you, they have their reasons. I'm not going to change that. I can't, right? I, I mean, in, in, in psychology, we call that transference. I can't control people's transference or response to me. And, and it could be something really simple. Like maybe I, I remind someone of a brother that they hate, I don't, you know, right? Like, so I can't take that personally. You know, maybe it's something I said that was not accurate. I could be that too. But, but I mean, the, the point is she wants to control all that. She wants to control people's perceptions of her. She wants to control her reviews. She wants to control these people attacking her instead of actually looking at the reality, which is that maybe these parent, maybe what you're espousing here is not healthy for kids. Right. That is not her issue. Her issue is the people questioning her. Collier, right. thanks for representing. He says us under thirties want Jody to leave us alone. Thanks for, thanks for representing the under thirties here. Collier. <laughs> Yeah, and and um, not to worry, she will be, unless she's unless she's live streaming from prison, which seems unlikely. But she'll probably she'll probably she'll probably be leaving most of us alone <laughs> at this point. Um, well, let's hope for a long I time. I don't know. Can you have a YouTube? By the way, channel a lot of a lot of people a lot of people mentioned how her attorney said that she's choosing to do this plea deal because she doesn't want the victims to suffer anymore. Yeah, right. People are saying this video is a great example of why people think. Yeah, right. Okay. Here we go. Let's keep going. Willing to humble yourselves and be curious about why they're doing what they're doing. You could watch this video and they would explain exactly why they're doing what they're doing. So I wanted to <clears throat> respond to another question. Is this going to cause childhood trauma? So the reality is that yes. there's nothing traumatic about this experience other than people's hateful, mean, aggressive, foul language coming towards this, this lovely family. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> As a reporter, that's what you call a sound bite, but you're like, got to put that in. So there is no such thing as childhood trauma when it comes to this. The only thing traumatic is are the people disagreeing with Jody? Yeah, and let, let me just say that 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 little bit there, I agree with you. That's that's a great sound bite, but that little bit there did not age well at all. Because uh, <laughs> clearly, that's all she did was leave behind a trail of trauma. That's all Ruby and Jody did was leave. I mean. If if you want to, if she doesn't see what she did as being traumatic for the victims, I don't know what is. So, so yeah, that's more than a little bit hypocritical. Yeah. Um, wow. Wow. All right. That's traumatic. What's going on inside their home is that principles of truth are being taught. And those two children in particular are learning how to be empathic and kind and loving and considerate. And it has nothing to do with receiving a tangible gift. So there's no trauma here. There's no trauma. Um, Just so young children always go through a selfish stage. Yes, yes and no. When a child acts selfish, quote unquote, it's not the same thing as an adult acting selfish because they don't have motive. They are 
learning if the people around them will teach them how to show empathy. If a child is not taught how to be empathic, which means they have to have boundaries, they need to know when they're being um, selfish, when they're being mean-spirited, when they're being uh, irresponsible, you have to reflect that to them. If so that is never up. taught to a child, they will grow up as an adult who is selfish. And so their children are not, it's not about them being selfish like an adult would be selfish. Now, are these two children learning to be empathic? Yes. And if they continued to behave the way that they were behaving and the parents then reinforced that behavior with, hey, you know, good job. And here's five gifts or here's 10 gifts. It would reinforce this this behavior that they don't agree with. This behavior of not having compassion towards another person. So children... Um, until they are taught and they are boundaried, will will focus on self. And that is our job as the adults is to help them not focus on self and to be aware that there's other people who are being affected by their behavior. So that last one, young children always go through a selfish stage. Why are they doing this drastic thing? Um, it's unfortunate that this is considered drastic. It's it's alarming that we live in a world that a parent is not um, is not supported to teach their children principles of truth because the world says, no, they're entitled to fill in the blank. Well, apparently Kevin and Ruby are not going to follow the world. They're going to follow truth and they're going to share and teach their children how to be loving and kind. And um, I, again, have been alarmed alarmed at the hatred that has come towards me and the hatred that's come towards them. Alarmed. Alarmed. What she is alarmed about is the hatred that has come towards her and these parents. Alarmed. And the foul language. Alarmed. But let's, my, uh, never mind the abuse. Yeah, My favorite part of that clip was that, that children have to be boundaried. She's, she's, she's taking it. She's, is that going to like, is that like going from Google to Googled? Like she's, she's taken a noun boundary and she's now she's made it into a verb. And not only that, like, it sounds like a really nasty verb. Like we're going to have to, we're going to have to boundary that person. They're going to get, I don't, right. What does that mean? Well, like, as, as Teresa says, she's confusing being boundaried as being bound. <laughs> Right, right. I, don't know I really, I really do think that was a slip. I, I think that was because being boundaried is not a thing. But all of a sudden, it is to Jody Hildebrand, and children need to be boundaried. Also, I think what does she mean branded? Like what does does she mean corralled? Like what? I so only Jody can 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 take the noun boundaried and and make it into a verb with it and like a nasty verb, like a, you know. We're going to boundary those being, we're going to, I don't know how you'd even add it to the dictionary, but um, that that's interesting to me. Yeah. It could be a slip, right? The bound. Yeah. They did, they did bind the kids. I think, I think it was a slip. <clears throat> being boundaried isn't a thing unless you're Jody Hildebrand and you need to boundary the kids physically. So what what is what, the other interesting thing she makes? She makes the point a couple of times is that the children need to abide by the parental principles of truth, right? And and I think you know it's it, I think it's one thing to have an interest in general parenting practices. I, I wouldn't call them principles of truth, but I, I think. Every kid is different. Every kid is a little idiosyncratic, right? I mean, what, what she's saying essentially is I don't want to look at the individual here or the specific needs of my child or the idiosyncrasies of my child, and they're all different. I just want to apply these principles of truth to every child in the same way. You know, I have this template. This is how I see the world. This is how you're going to – this is the way you churn out perfect kids is you apply these principles of truth. Never mind that every child's different. Every child has different needs, right? Expectations, dreams, hopes, 
fears. She ignores all that. She doesn't care. And that, by the way, is how you get to dehumanization. That's how you get to a lack of empathy, is you see, you, you rely on principles of truth and not the specific needs of a child. And, and clearly she's doing that here. And then just the projection, she needs the boundaries. She needs to be boundaried, and she is now. The, <laughs> the, the projection is wild. Right. She's, yeah, right. she's. Again, things she's, that didn't age well. She's been boundaried. She's been she's boundaried. Been things that didn't age well, 2023. 20, <laughs> okay. That is the trauma here. That is the drastic. That is the sad situation of our world that's, that people, and I'm not considering that most people, but there are some that want to hurt others because they don't agree with what another person is doing. So I you, hope that Jody. that's helpful. Um, you're going to see much more of me and Ruby. We're going to be starting the new year talking about these particular yes, issues more. in more detail. So if you are interested in learning about truth, because that's where Ruby and I will stand, is on the line of truth. And if you see people starting to attack us and starting to say things, please know that truth has always been attacked and we're <laughs> ready and, and willing to um, stand and hold that line. And those of you who want to learn about truth and learn how to parent your children inside truth and create lovely beings that live in truth and, and have joy, then come follow us uh, at the beginning of 2022. Merry Christmas, and we will be seeing each other soon. And my name is Jody Hill. You were right. It was 2021, probably, that she was saying that. All so, right. Yeah. I, I agree with what Love A Scorpio said. I'm surprised that her ego let her take a plea deal. I I agree. It is mind blowing to watch. Yeah. Like, I mean, right. How how do you think she how do you think she was convinced to take a plea deal? I agree. I think it's gonna be interesting to see at the sentencing hearing what she says and how she says it. And whether she does express remorse, I mean, I, I the it's the short answer to your question is I think her lawyer, who I happen to know by the way, he's he's an excellent attorney, Doug Terry, in Southern Utah. Um, I think he talked some sense into her. I think he said, "Look, you're up against it here. You know, I you may think you did nothing wrong." But I'm pretty sure that the, the judicial system and the court here are going to beg to differ. So we can take this to trial. I mean, ultimately, he's going to go with his, what his client wants. But uh, I'm sure he just said, look, if you go to trial here, you're probably looking at upwards of, I don't know, 30, 40 years in prison. So, you know, it's probably better to take it, you know, to take her chances with a judge and do some negotiating and see what they're amenable to rather than to go in front of a jury. But I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, ultimately the client drives the process and if she was completely ego driven, she probably wouldn't have listened to him. She was right about one thing in that video. We'll be seeing a lot more of Ruby and Jody in the future. They're not backing down. <laughs> <laughs> right and we've been seeing a lot more of them they have really made the internet in 2022 <laughs> right and 2023 well, I, i've lost track of years well also by the way if she was worried about being attacked back then uh you know it's a good thing she's not on social media now because i'm pretty sure the attacks have escalated too so what she was experiencing back then is child's play compared to what's going on now Question, Dr. John, is she even capable of realizing she did something wrong? I have the same question in my mind. Yeah, that's that's a really tough one. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'd have to, I would have, with somebody like her, I'd have to, to sit down in a, in a, a meeting room and just get to know her and do some testing. And I, I don't know, you know, if, if you, if you look at her history and you look at 
Jesse's interview on Mormon stories? I, 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 it's, it's a big question mark to me. I'd be a little skeptical about whether she could genuinely experience remorse or empathy or recognize what she did was wrong, but I guess it's possible. Hmm. Maybe if she gets out of distortion. Yeah, it is. A lot of people are saying this, that was unthinkable, that video. It is, it is unbelievable watching that video. Um, it makes me believe Jesse. Jesse said that their aunt fully believed it. Jesse said that their aunt fully believed it, and it makes me feel like she does. You know, and, because and she just refuses to see anything else but what she believes. And Jesse also was quite adamant about the fact that she, that they believed that. Jody was a psychopath and I don't know how she, how they came to that conclusion, but, but it, it, cause it, it's clearly a very strong conclusion to reach. And it's one that I wouldn't be able to reach, but just from what I know, but, but if, if that's the case, then this idea of remorse would be for, for, for psychopath in theory, understanding remorse would be, nearly impossible true remorse question from m taylor could you speculate how hildebrandt will handle her time in prison yeah i mean so we talked about that a little earlier but i think there's there's a couple of things i there there's there's a couple of sort of conflicting elements with jody in prison. Number one is given her crimes, that's going to be a hard road that, you know, the, in, in, in prison for, it doesn't matter what gender, but crimes against children are frowned upon and inmates that have very serious crimes against children are usually subjected to violence and uh, oftentimes are seen as outcasts, even within the prison hierarchy. So I, I think that would suggest you might have a really difficult time in prison. However, knowing her and her personality and sort of this, this cult leader persona, I could see her also dominate. I could see her trying to dominate in prison and, I could see her developing a lot of followers and, and, you know, I, I, so I, I think you have kind of conflicting strands there of how prison will be for her, but ultimately, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I think those two kind of run into each other. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, but, but I don't, I, you know, given her personality and how dominant she likes to be and how controlling it wouldn't be hard to imagine that she would have a lot of influence in in prison. Dominating is a great word to describe Jody Hildebrandt. I, 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 truly, I noticed. So, so you know, I'm used to editing videos and and cutting sound bites. As a reporter, I couldn't ever pause it at a time where she took a breath because when she finished one sentence, she would quickly start the next sentence, and that is, in my opinion, dominating. She's saying, I'm not going to give anyone else a moment to speak. I can tell she never let anyone else speak. Anything else you want to say right now? Mm, not really. Happy New Year to our gems. <laughs> I think this is interesting. I just got to say, throw this out. You know, foul language really, really upsets her. She has these extremely strict Puritan type views, you know, um, foul language again is sinful to her. Uh, if there was indeed a romantic relationship with Ruby Frankie, that could be one thing that she did not want coming out in court because, you know, what she preaches is anti LGBT 
and all that communication between Ruby and her, you know, it is something. I agree. That's in, yeah, that right. Um, yeah, that's interesting. That's probably something that she, that's true. That's probably something she wouldn't want to be made public. Yes. Well, anything, um, I remember the first live we did on this case. You were very concerned that this was going to go away, that they might get a slap on the wrist, figuratively, not literally, but a slap on the wrist <clears throat> because of other child abuse cases you had seen in yeah. Utah and, and other places. Thoughts now? Yeah, so... I, you know, this is one of those instances where the true crime community has really made a difference. I think that by the true crime community and internet sleuths and detectives picking this up, I think they've really added immense value by bringing this to people's attention and by putting some pressure on pretend, potentially some pressure on the judicial system to act in a, a fair way, in a reasonable way. And I think it's made a difference. I think this is exactly the type of case that if it had no, if it received no attention whatsoever, I think it could have been swept under the rug and ignored and avoided. And I doubt you would have had prison time. So this is, this is a, a crime, I think, where there was a lot of value added in the true crime in the um, in the internet and online true crime communities, and so I'm very grateful for that. Hopefully, we played a role in that. Hopefully, our gems really, you know, they a lot of them have been vocal about this case, and and I'm grateful for that. And I, I think they've added a lot of value, and and hopefully, we've played a small role in bringing attention to this case. And thank goodness that it wasn't swept under the rug. Your mic is off. Oh, CC, I'm not going to read your comment because I agree with you that, that this is a better episode for Patreon behind a paywall. But I hear you. And I think that, John, maybe we could discuss that on Patreon sometime oh, yeah. in the new year. So, so yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, that would be, that would be, though, that would be a Patreon discussion since, uh, I, I think uh, we've done what, like five or six episodes on this and we've been demonetized on like four or five, most of them. So last week's, you know, when we made a big deal about like being very careful with our words, we were demonetized. <laughs> so we just kind of gave up today, but, uh, we will continue these conversations, these hard ones over on Patreon and we've had many bonus episodes over there. Um, if, if anyone chooses to support us over on Patreon and our work into 2024, you will get a catalog of, I think nearly a hundred, um, bonus episodes that we have not shared on YouTube or elsewhere. Sorry, go ahead, John. I interrupted you. I've been doing that a lot today. I love you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. My mic off. It's, it's, it's fine. It's, it's been a stressful week. So, um, Yeah, no, I, right. We have to be careful with our discussion here. So we will, we'll, we, we will certainly anticipate picking up some, some more controversial topics on Patreon about this case in the next few weeks, especially around sentencing, I would expect. Thank you to so many that gifted memberships tonight. And for those new members, and for your support tonight, it means so much to us. We love our growing community. Please hit subscribe and notifications. I do plan to attend the sentencing on February 20th with the Utah Parole Board. I realized that uh, originally I said it was a judge that sentences them, and it looks like they're going to go before a parole board. So I'll be there. So thank you, everyone for your support. I agree, Sterling. People who gift memberships are the best. Thank you, everything.
Anything else, John, do you want to conclude with? Um, somebody just mentioned that they, they like the quotes I have at the end. I actually don't have a quote for tonight. So, um, I have been, I've been a little distracted because I'm actually giving a lot of thought to my mother's eulogy, which I'll be, I'll be, I'll be performing that, or I guess that's not the right term. Um, I will be giving my mother's eulogy tomorrow morning. So I think I'm a little preoccupied. So I, I don't have a quote for tonight, but I, I do just want to end with a lot of gratitude to our gems and our community. And uh, I'm so, I feel so grateful to be a part of this community and thank you for a wonderful year. And um, I want to wish all our gems a wonderful new year, a happy new year. And I will, I promise I'll be back with more quotes. I just, I'm a little bogged down with thoughts about my mother. So I, I apologize for that, but there's more quotes on the horizon, I promise, and more literature to think about and read. And we'll talk about that too. Yeah. Thank you everyone for being here tonight. May you uh, have a happy 2020 end of 2023. And may we all have a happy 2024 to be determined TBD. We'll see. Thanks everyone. Have a good night. All right. Good night.